No, this is a blessing to be here. We were here, Janet probably told you some years ago, for the Korean speaking group and were translated, but this first time with the English group. But we've seen uh, a lot of you different places along the way, so it's, it's a blessing to be here. Did Janet behave yesterday? <laughs> she, she mentioned you a lot. <laughs> you're, you're, did somebody say no? Because you're, you're the only one that's not lying. I <laughs> oh, love that woman. She's amazing. It's a real adventure just living with her. You, know? <laughs> you can tell, huh? And I know she talked about me. I know pretty much what she says about me. So anyway, I'll, I'll try to get even where if I can. But <laughs> now that I only know good about her, so I'll only say good things. But it's a blessing to be with you. And I'm only here this morning and tonight, so we'll buckle up. We'll try to throw not too much in, but, but a number of things. So um, I love a statement by Ellen White where she says that we can learn more from the Holy Spirit in one moment than we can from all the great men of the world. By the way, Harvey, that was a super presentation where you are. I just love the brilliance and the, the way of presenting tough information in a way that we feel like, hey, I think I'll go home and try this maybe, you know, I'll give a little shot. Yeah. So anyhow, but I'd like to just begin by believing that Jesus taught us in Luke 11. The disciples saw all the amazing things that were happening out of Jesus' ministry. And they said, wow, it's because of your prayer, your connection to the Father. Tell us how you do this. So he gave them the Lord's Prayer. Then he gave him this story about the persistent friend and said, you know, go on, keep on, keep on asking, keep on knocking, keep on seeking. And then in Luke 11, he talks about his father is so good, he will only give us the good things. And he, he mentions the Holy Spirit, which brings every other gift in his train. So uh, let's take just a minute, maybe stand with me, keep your blood flowing a little before we start here and just ask the Holy Spirit silently Based on that promise, say, God, I want him to come in to baptize me this morning, to uh, speak to me. He can whisper to you something in this time that can change your life. And uh, so let's just give him permission to do that. Lord, thank you. When you promise something, you always come through. And you said you always say yes to the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the way you want to be all about us and in us and to bring all the things into our life that we need so much to bear fruit and to be like Jesus. So help me, help us in this time to hear you speaking to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Tony Campolo, you know him? <laughs> he tells a story about going to a Bible college to speak for the graduation. He said when he got there, these eight young guys took him in a back room, knelt around and put their hands on his head and he said, they began to pray for me. And he said, that's good. Uh, as a leader, I need all the people praying for me I can get, amen? <laughs> but he said, you know, these guys, and they, they were earnest and they prayed long prayers. He said, they went on and on and on and on. And he said, the longer they prayed, the tireder they became. Pretty soon they began to lean on my head. <laughs> and he said, I don't know if you've had eight guys leaning on your head lately, but I wish they'd quit. <laughs> He said, one guy, he wasn't even praying for me. He was praying for some guy named Charlie Stolzfus. He said, oh, Lord, you know Charlie Stolzfus. You know, he lives two miles down the road on the right-hand side in that little silver house. Lord, he left his wife and his three kids this morning. God, intervene, step in, do something, save, save that family. So when he got done, he prayed it again. He told God where he lived again. He said, God, God you know Charlie Stolzfus. He lives two miles down the road on the right-hand side in that little silver house. Tony said, I felt like he's saying... Do you think God said, I missed that address. Could you give that to me again? <laughs> Lord, he, he left his wife and his three kids this morning. God, step in, do something, intervene, save that family. He said, finally he quit, the other guys quit, and I was able to preach my sermon. And I was I'm headed home, went out, got in my car, headed towards the highway. And I was getting on the on-ramp, and here's this guy with his thumb stuck out hitchhiking. And he said, I know, you shouldn't pick up hitchhikes. That's dangerous, they could do something to you. But he said, I'm a preacher. Anytime I can get somebody in my car to tell them about Jesus, I'd do it. So I picked the guy up, we're headed down the road, and I said, hi, my name's Tony, what's yours? And he said, my name's... Charlie. You're right, Asians are smart. They got that. <laughs> he said, yeah, my name's Charlie Stolzfus. Tony said, I looked at him, my eyes got big, and I got off at the next exit. And I went across the bridge and I headed back. He was really scared by then. He got up against the door, he said, mister, where are you taking me? Tony said, I'm taking you home. <laughs> And he said, why? He said, because you left your wife and your three kids this morning, didn't you? <laughs> Charlie says, yes, how did you know that? Tony says, God told me. <laughs> I believe he did, what do you think? Anyway, he said, then I went to that other road, two miles down the road, I saw this little silver house, I pulled in his driveway. 
That blew his mind. He said, Mister, how did you know I live here? Tony said, God told me. His wife came to the door. You know, she said, man, you're back, you're back. What happened? So Charlie tells a story, whispers in her ear, points at Tony. Her eyes get big. And Tony said, I said to those two young people, I said, now you two get in your house. You sit down. I'm going to talk and you're going to listen. <laughs> he said, man, did they listen to me? It was like I was God himself. <laughs> and he said, that afternoon I was able to lead those two young people to Jesus. And that guy's a preacher in California today. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Our God is amazing. You know, he loves people so much. He loves your kids. He loves you. And he will do miracles. He does miracles. The impossible to men is the possible to our God. That's what the Bible says. And of course, as Janet's already been sharing with you, we've discovered that when we cry out to him, when we call on his name, personally or even together, especially in groups, God is able, he's unleashed to do things that he can't do if we don't call on him. And uh, look at Jeremiah 33, 3 with me for a minute. It's uh, a promise, God's word. One man said, this is uh, God's cell phone number. Jeremiah 33, 3. I mark my promises in blue in the Bible, so when I open it up, have my worship, it just jumps out at me, the, the promises, the good things. He says, call to me, and I will what? I will answer you. Do you believe that? Do you believe every time you call on God, he answers you? Every time? Yeah, eventually you say. And does he always say yes? He does always give us what we want, right? I had a friend of mine who said, if God really wanted to punish me, he'd answer all my prayers yes. <laughs> I think back in my life, how much of my time in prayer with the God of the universe who creates worlds with the word, I'm telling him what to do. You know, I think you should do this. I think you should do that. And I looked at the times I thought I really wanted something and I was pleading and I didn't get it. Sometime soon after that, I said, oh, glad I didn't go to that conference. Everything blew up there. I'm glad they didn't make me president there. Whatever. Anyway. But I love the rest of the promise. He says, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. That's my testimony. Uh, God has given us this beautiful thing of communication with him, prayer. And when we spend time with him, when we talk, when we pray, when we praise, when we listen, um, God has always shown us things. He shows us things about his own personality, his own character. He's funny. He's powerful. He doesn't answer prayer the way I think he's going to every time. He answers it differently because he's a creator. And it's like with Janet. You know, if I take time to really talk to her and to really listen, um, then we have intimacy. Then we have communication. And if Janet were here, she'd nod heartily when I say, one of my big problems is not listening well. <laughs> I'm a man, administrator. Uh, I got a lot to say. When she starts talking, I think I know the answer before she started, you know. And then I butt in and interrupt her. It really irritates her really bad. She, she, she can get angry. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> she looks really sweet, but <laughs> no. And rightly so. By the way, as I'm starting, I just want to say one thing about Janet. You know, I, I was a young pastor, and I'll give you briefly my testimony in a minute. But I um, looked very successful. Came out of seminary, went to Chicago, youth pastor, they liked me. I went downstate, they wanted me to plant a church in a dark county, and we did. So I got called to Colorado, where I grew up, into a larger district. And then we wanted to get the layman involved, we got our layman involved, we had tremendous growth. So then they made me personal ministries director of the Rocky Mountain Conference at 30. That's successful, wouldn't you say? Successful pastor. Then, you heard Janet's testimony yesterday. Um, 36, we were back in Pennsylvania, been there a year, they made me president of the conference at 36 in North America. Wow, successful young pastor, huh? But you remember the rest of her testimony? <laughs> this successful young pastor um, didn't even know that his wife had died spiritually right by his side. That's not successful. Guys, <laughs> we need to listen. We need to know our family. We need to know their spiritual heart, where are they at. Uh, she was going to church, taking the kids through the form, but had given up on her own salvation, given up on ever really having a relationship with God. That's pretty hard to admit, but I just, uh, I know Koreans are a success-oriented culture. <laughs> Success is much more than what we look like, you know, what people in the world think when they see us. It's, it really comes down to that relationship with God and the family and those things. So, anyway. Um, I love this story by Tony because it does show that when we spend time with God 
uh, He reveals things to us. And I've discovered that when we're praying together, if we take the time to really pray together, united prayer in groups, even twos or threes, that God sometimes reveals things through each other. He teaches us. There's, there's a balancing. Ellen White says there's more power in united prayer. Why? Because of the unity of heart and the oneness of purpose. And she says we, we don't get extreme if we have some other people to help balance us back. We, we may be off the track on something. And having some other people that we meet with and talk to God and watch the answers to prayer makes a big difference. I don't know how it works, but I know uh, uh, Angel Rodriguez, who used to be the BRI director at the GC when we first got there. One day we were riding along on the way to a big meeting in Nigeria, and we were talking to him about prayer. He said, you know, I think we ought to do a big theology of prayer in the church, because he said, how does it work? What is it? How does it really take place? And he said, I, one thing I know for sure, there's the great controversy going on, and every war has rules of engagement. And he said, I know with my heart what the Bible says, that prayer is one of the rules of engagement God set up in the great controversy. And it says, some things you have not because you ask not. And one of the rules is that we don't get some things that we don't ask. We don't unleash His power unless we're crying out to Him and calling on His name together. So, by God's grace, I want to be a person who takes advantage of everything God is giving me. Um, and I want to take just a minute and go to a very familiar passage with you, John 14 and 15. You know it very well. So why would I take our time this morning to talk about it? Because as we travel all over the world, 200,000 miles a year, we're finding that Adventists everywhere know this, we talk about it, we discuss it in Sabbath school classes. I'm going to kill myself here. Aren't I? But we aren't doing it like we should be. Uh, you know the story. Jesus is taking his disciples for one last couple of hours to the upper room. And on the way, um, they're arguing. What are they arguing about? Who's going to be the power person in the church, right? Uh, who's going to be the greatest? It must have broken his heart, don't you think? And we find all over the world that pastors and elders, the people we work with, but members too, um, always worried about who's really in control and who's done what to whom and who's, who's in charge. Um, I know the Korean culture doesn't have that problem. <laughs> we did have Korean churches. No, that, there's a little of that there too. But Anyway, uh, Jesus, so he, he takes his disciples in the upper room, here they are. They're supposed to take over the New Testament church very soon, take the gospel to the whole world, and they're arguing over who's going to be the next president of the conference, and they don't even know what the church is. So how does he do it? Well, you know, John 13, first of all, he kneels before Judas. One last shot at getting Judas to repent, and with love he washes his feet. Humility, that Philippians 2 Jesus who made himself nothing for us. That was a big lesson. But Judas went out, those 30 pieces of silver. That he was so smart, so strategic that he had planned how to make Jesus be king. And so anyway, he, he spends the rest of the time talking to his other disciples, the 11. And if you were going to die and knew it in a couple of weeks, what would you do? I know one thing I'd want to do is call my family around me, my kids. i got some grandkids. I want to make sure that I shared with them everything I thought could help them, right? <laughs> wisdom I'd gained over all these years and how to get to heaven for sure by God's grace and all those things. And that's what Jesus did. And these words in chapter 13 to 17 of John are a summary of Jesus' most important teachings, his greatest burdens, what he, what he wanted to say to them to help them be converted after the cross and to be able to take Pentecost to the world. So that's what he talks about. And what do we find there? Uh, look, look with me. Got John open. I love the way he starts. Well, chapter 13, it says he loved them to the end. And that's the big story, that Jesus was loving them, still loving them. But the disciples were fearful. They were worried. Jesus said he was leaving. They were arguing. They were selfish. But he says to them first, 14, 1 to 3, you could quote it with me, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He gives them assurance of salvation. <laughs> I hope all of you here at camp meeting this week have it, that you know you're right with God at this moment. We, we can lose it, we can turn away, we can get divorced, but if you don't know for sure that you have eternal life, 
It can mess you up and your kids and people you're trying to witness to. It just doesn't work to say, come and join my church and give up meat and <laughs> everything else, right? And uh, maybe you'll make it. <laughs> if you don't sin just before you get hit by a bus, you, you probably make it okay. <laughs> no, that's not the message. The message is adoption. It's marriage. It's a covenant relationship we enter with him. And Jesus' righteousness covers us. And, and he is building a mansion for us. <laughs> so no matter what we got here, it's coming good. We're going to be a joint heir with Jesus who has everything. Amazing. Amazing the gospel. So that's what he starts with and gives him that hope. And then I want to get to verse 12 to 14. There's so many other things in here. He talks about the Holy Spirit. talks about love and obedience. But he talks about something a lot. Verse 12 to 14. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And then these promise, it's said twice, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Do you believe that promise? Do you believe that? Greater works than Jesus did, in the extent, <laughs> not in you know, raising people from the dead is pretty big, and saving the world was pretty big, but um, we can be doing amazing things, and should be in our churches, in our world. Uh, I don't know if you have the handouts, but in that first sheet on statements on prayer and empowered ministries, number one statement, Ellen White and Acts of the Apostles says that every believer today should be doing what the, the apostles did in the book of Acts. Wow, what did they do? Got in a room, confessed their sins to each other, prayed, praised, and then Pentecost fell and they were healing people, handkerchiefs, <laughs> healed people, they raised folks from the dead, there was, uh, don't have money, but get up and walk away. Uh, they spread the gospel in 25 years to the whole world. Amazing, persecuting culture. And we're supposed to be doing those kind of amazing things. How is it in your church? How is it in America? And we were just got back from Kazakhstan and, and Istan countries. How is it in the Adventist family around the world? And, but notice this promise is amazing. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do. Look at chapter 15, 5. And this is the one we, can, we quote, we talk about in Sabbath school. <laughs> all the time. I was looking at the vines driving in today. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, what? Bears much fruit. You will bear fruit. For without me, you can do how much? Nothing. You guys know Korean? I don't know if you do. What's nothing in Korean? You don't know Korean, do you? <laughs> Second, third, fourth generation. The word really it doesn't. Okay, so it's nothing's there. Nothing's there. Okay, so it's that nothing. Anyway, do you believe that? Without Jesus, we can do nothing? Do you really believe that? That's a big question, isn't it? And we talk about it, we talk about it, but we don't live it, really. Mark Finley said to me probably 12 years ago, he said, Jerry, um, I travel this world. And you, if anybody travels a lot, it's Mark Finley. <laughs> you know, I mean, he had to stop here to die. But anyway, um, he said, I travel everywhere, and Adventists are working, 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 trying to do the mission everywhere. He said, Adventists work hard. I don't think they could work harder if they tried. But he said, we're just not taking time to connect for the power. We're just not taking time to connect for the power. I don't know how it is in your life, but I know how tough it is for me. Um, you know, I got a conference call at 10 tonight because someone, someone's in Europe and someone's in Australia. We're all trying to talk about publishing a book, you know, and we're all trying to find some time when we might still be awake and wake up in the morning and somebody in Asia needs something and office is closing in an hour. Should I pray? Should I have devotions? Or should I get that to them? You know, you're, you're faced with all these kind of things all the time. And then verse 7 and 8. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. There's number three. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So then you will be my disciples. He talks about love, keeping his commandments. But then in verse 12 or 11, he says, uh, your joy will remain in you and your joy will be full. Notice verse 16, though. He says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And what's that promise? That whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Okay, that's four times. Do you know in chapter 16 there's three more? The exact same promise from Jesus. Do you think that's important to him? His last words to his disciples before they're supposed to rock this world and turn it upside down is, please ask, ask. 
ask, ask seven times, ask, please. I'm sitting in heaven praying for you, ask, please. I can do so much more if you will ask, just ask. Prayer is not just something over here, a little thing we do once in a while. It is something that is underused and leaving us powerless too much of the time. You know? And again, not here to whip us over that. Do you have the handouts? Maybe you don't have them this morning. If you do, look at that. Uh, thanks. A little more cord help. Um, if you look at um, that first sheet, take just a second with it. Statements on prayer and empowered ministries. Um, these are some of my favorites from Ellen White. You still believe in Ellen White, do you? <laughs> I tell you, every, before every great event in history, God has sent us a major lifetime of prophet. You think he wouldn't before the second coming? And just read her again if you're wondering. That just power comes out of it all over. Anyway, um, th there's that first statement, number one. All that the apostles did every church member today is to do. Number two talks about that revival of true godliness, which is our greatest need in every culture, every place, and it is. Um, is that, uh, do you find it's on the very first sheet when you open your handouts? Most of you don't have it, I guess. But anyway, uh, but it, it ends up saying our work, you know, our greatest need is a revival of true godliness. Okay, and it's not some other task, but it's the spiritual change and revival and reformation. But she says we need, our work is to get the Holy Spirit by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer. And the last sentence of that paragraph says a revival that is our greatest need is need be expected only in answer to prayer. Number three says at the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. Hallelujah. Anything that makes Satan's host tremble, I want. And she says, prayer is it because we're calling on the God of the universe and somehow in the, it's unleashing his power in the universe. But number nine, it's kind of long. If you don't have it, just listen carefully. But it, it convicts me every time I read it. She says, an intensity such as never before was seen is taking possession of the world. Amusement, money making, the contest for power. In the very struggle for existence, there's a terrible force that engrosses body and mind and soul. Is that true? Are we sucked into this world? So much going on. She says, um, in the midst of this maddening rush, God is speaking. He bids us come apart and commune with him. Be still and know that I am God, Psalms 46.10. And then this paragraph, she says, many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with Jesus. We're in too great haste. We hurry, with hurried steps, we press through the circle of Christ's loving presence. Pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for counsel. We have no time to remain with the divine teacher. With our burdens, we return to our work. What is that? Enough time to wait for counsel. Our Bible's open. Praying with a Bible open. God's speaking to us through that. Speaking to our hearts. Repentance we need. Or plans that we need for the day. Or, or whatever. Like he did for Jesus. Pleading for the baptism of the Spirit. She says, these workers can never attain the highest success. There's what we want, is success. Until they learn the secret of strength. They must give themselves time to think, to pray, to wait upon God for a renewal of physical, mental, and spiritual power. We need the uplifting influence of His Spirit. Receiving this, we're quickened by fresh life. The weird frame and tired brain will be refreshed. The burdened heart lightened. How do we get really refreshed? <laughs> Jesus stayed up really late, <laughs> got up really early, but He was plugged in like a cell phone charger, right? And He came out energized and charged. I want that. Not a pause for a moment in His presence, but personal contact with Jesus to sit down in companionship with him. This is my need. How about you? And I believe it's one of our greatest, greatest needs is to just go to bed a little earlier if need be, take a little extra time. So when we get up in the morning, eat better in the evening, eat lighter. Janet and I try not to eat much at night because when we get up in the morning, it's a cement block. If we, now we should, we're gonna give a donation to the cafe over there, but, <laughs> but we're not gonna come. <laughs> Because I, I have a really weak will when it comes to desserts. Anyway, let's, let's not talk about that. <laughs> You'll be picking on me tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, not here to just uh, whip you with that. But it is so key to our joy, and our happiness, to everything. Jesus came at it, came at it, came at it. Abide in me. Please abide in me. Let me abide in you. When that happens, you'll be filled with joy. You will obey my commandments. You will see your children change. Things will be happening. Everything will come together when we really connect like Jesus did, like Paul did over and over talking about prayer. So um, when I was a young guy in Colorado, personal ministries director, I went to a 
a meeting up in the lodge and Janet wasn't with me. There were two beds there. In the middle of the night I had a dream and it was virtual reality. I was sure it was happening. You've had them. And in the other bed, I thought it was not Bob Rice, the educational guy, but it was my wife, Janet. <laughs> yeah, so I began to get excited. I like Janet, I love Janet. So I got up in my sleep and began to sleepwalk across the room towards poor Bob, thinking it was Janet. <laughs> and I ended up standing over him in the darkness of the night. We were both asleep. He was sound asleep, I was too. I thought it was Janet, so I began to crawl into bed with Bob. That was my most embarrassing moment in life. And Bob, he's got a great sense of humor. He said, Jerry, I won't tell a soul. <laughs> I said, no, Bob, I'm telling everybody at breakfast before you get a chance to tell it your way. <laughs> and that's what I did. I called all the pastors together and I told them about my sleepwalking experience. And I tell you that today because as I look back over my spiritual journey in my life, God has been so good to me. But I realize how often I thought I was awake when really I was asleep. You hear me? How often? I mean, this thing I told you about Janet, I, how could I have done that? I was having time with God, I was working hard, I didn't, I didn't want to be a bad husband, but I didn't even know what was going on in her heart. So often in my life it's been that way. And it started out when I was a kid, really, I, and I'm going to tell you just very briefly my testimony because I don't have a lot of time here. I grew up in a preacher's home, my dad was a publishing director, my mom was a teacher, taught in Adventist schools. So I had Adventism in my blood. And uh, they were busy with the LA rallies and praising God for answered prayers and stuff. But I was at home watching TV <laughs> and running with guys that weren't too good for me and I wasn't good for them. And uh, my mother, bless her heart, and this is important, my mother had a very low self-esteem and she couldn't believe God loved her. And she knew she was a, such a sinner and she didn't believe she'd be saved. So dad was out on the road, he was grace oriented, he believed in assurance and salvation, but mom was at home with me. So with mom it was all about doing the rules. It was about obeying, you know, you got these rules in the Adventist church and there's a bunch of them, you know. And she wasn't measuring up very well. I remember one day I started getting kind of rebellious. There's a, there's a principle that says this, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Uh, that is so true. And I began to get rebellious and she saw that happening. She said, Jerry, listen, you know the rules. You know what you should be doing. She said, you can be saved. But she, she said, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> I'm not going to be saved, but you, you could be saved. How's that for a good way to win your kids? Huh? And yet we do that sometimes, <laughs> I think, in, in subtle ways. But anyway, she said, you know, the investigative judgment's going on. Your name can come up in the judgment any time. And if you just sin, you're lost. You, you know, you've got to, you know. So, I mean, I grew up with that, so I, I rebelled against it. I didn't want the church. I had decided by seventh or eighth grade that the church was going to take away all my fun, all my adventure in life, you know. And I wanted adventure. I wanted excitement. I was a leader, and I wanted to, to do fun things. So... I won't waste a lot of our time today telling you how bad I was, but it got worse, and it got worse, and I was proud of being bad. I got kicked out of three of our academies. And every time I got kicked out of an academy, my folks said to me, now, which Adventist school do you want to go to next? <laughs> <laughs> they believed in Adventist education, and that was good because it kept me with the backslidden kids. <laughs> and when I finally got away, I was still running around with backslidden Adventist kids, and there's some value in that. But anyway, uh, when I got to college, I said, okay, I want out tired of it. I don't want the church. I don't want the rules. Please let me just go. No. One year to our Adventist college or we won't help you with finances. <laughs> so I went to Union College for a year, stayed as far away from religious stuff as I could down at the university playing pool and taking drugs and doing stuff. And, uh, but I made it through the year finally, barely, and went to State College in Denver. I was taking, I had a good job, was, had money to spend. I was living with a bunch of people. We were doing drugs and began to sell drugs had money, I was a business major with pre-law, and I had it going, and I was totally free. But my parents did one thing right. <laughs> I have wonderful parents, they're gone now. I see them both in heaven, my mother understood salvation better before she died, and uh, she'll be there, you know, she's covered by Jesus. But um, they, my mother was probably 190% cleric, I mean, that was just my mom, you know. And when, when Jerry was <laughs> headed down the, the toilet, <laughs> she got everybody praying for me, and everybody she could, and my dad, same thing. I run into people today that say, I was a student literature evangelist with your father way back then. And he used to pull the car over by the road and he'd say, I don't know what's going on, but will you pray with me for my boy Jerry? Huh? And he looked down on the city of Denver from his house and tried to figure out, pray for me. They got everybody they could praying for me. And I praise God. There is a power in united prayer. 
And they prayed me miserable. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I can't tell you how it works. I don't, some people get prayed for more than others. God has to figure that all out. But I know this. When he says, where two or three pray, when you unite in prayer, it unleashes my power. I believe that. I've seen it over and over and over again. So, if your kids, I tell you this today because if your kids, you're worried about, and you don't see the fire in them you'd like to for God, maybe they're still going to church, maybe they aren't, I just encourage you today, don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Instead, get more people praying for them. Don't hide it. It's not a matter of shame. It's a matter of, uh, my kid needs Jesus. Please pray with me about it. And pray and pray and get others praying. Anyway, long story short, I, I got more and more miserable. We were so selfish, all of us. We were cheating each other in drug deals. We, we hated each other in many ways. And just, I was getting isolated in my relationships and everything. One Saturday, my girl and I took some really strong psychedelic stuff. And we didn't know what it was. By the end of the day, we were finally coming down. But we were sitting in our apartment and we said, wow. We are so miserable. <laughs> What's with this? We thought we'd be happy. We're free. We can do what we want. And as we talked together, the Holy Spirit was there. And he was the evangelist. And he reminded us of all that training, this VBS you're putting in your kids. That comes back. He says, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they can't get away from that training. <laughs> we can't force them to be saved, but we sure can make them miserable. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> That's right. So you're doing a right, doing a good thing. Keep those kids in DBS in school. Pathfinders, the whole game. I got kicked out of Pathfinders. I didn't even get that. <laughs> anyway, but that night we started thinking, and God led our minds to think about what we were looking for, and we realized that everybody who treated us good, no matter how bad we treated them, were Adventist Christians. And I praise God for that. The little lady brought us food at the apartment. The Bible worker, he was a redheaded ex-alcoholic, wild and crazy, hot temper. Dad had him in the L.A. work, and he said, go get my boy. And he came to the apartment, and we were not nice to him, slammed the door in his face. He said, I was going down the steps of your apartment, and I said, God, I don't care. Let him go to hell. <laughs> and he said, God grabbed me and said, get back up there. So he came back up, knocked on the door again. I came to the door, and he said, buddy, listen, someday you're going to need me. And when you do, here's my number. Put it in my pocket. And so anyway, that night we thought about all that. Our parents had treated us good no matter how we treated them. And late that night, we decided, you know what? What we're looking for is love. And we remembered that God is love. So we decided to give Jesus a chance. He said it was 3 in the morning when we called him and said, come on over. We want to start talking. And we did. And God changed my life just in time. We were selling cocaine on the back streets of Boulder. Treasure's kid had been killed in a drug deal. We were talking about needles because we'd get a better high. Just that close. And yet God has let me lead in this church. He's amazing. He can save me. I can tell you that I just went back to a reunion in my academy and, and the kids keep saying, I can't believe that you are a Christian, a pastor. You're leading the church. We can't believe it, you know. But my life has been so different, you know, what it could have been. God saved me just in time. Now, some of my buddies, their minds are not right. And Janet thinks mine isn't too good. But, but anyway, praise God. Six months later, my dad was in the baptistry. Tears running down his face, baptizing my girlfriend and I. And, um, you know, at that point, I thought, you know, there isn't time to go to school. I don't know what I should do. And I, I began to feel, maybe I should be a pastor. I should work for God somehow. I thought, but there isn't time. He's coming soon. Don't you feel that way somehow? Yeah, he's coming soon. And so I didn't know what to do. God was so good to me. You know, six months later, I walked, I cut my hair, my long beard. I'd come out of rock music and everything. And went back to Andrews, walked on the campus, looked like a preacher. And uh, the guy in charge of all the Christian activities that year, he talked to me. He said, oh, you're going to take theology. He said, we're going we're gonna, to, we're on a revival here. We're going to take 13 groups of 12 or 13 kids each. We're going to pray and sing and be in small groups. Then we're going to go out every Sabbath. And by next spring, we're going to hold evangelistic meetings, student evangelistic meetings. He said, would you coordinate all that for us? And I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I, I didn't know how to do that too well. I knew how to sell stuff. But, you know, anyway, but God put... <laughs> God put me to work right away. Praise God, and it saved my soul. Total member involvement is important to get involved. Um, so much more I could share about that, but I won't right now. I tell you, the next day, my worst friend running a porn studio showed up at my apartment. Had never been there. A six pack of beer. Just wanted to spend some time talking. And he began to drill me. He said, You, the one, he knew how to get me, because the one thing I didn't want to be was mommy's boy. And he said, You know what? You've just been indoctrinated by your mommy. 
said, there's, there's no God. It's all cyclical. It just starts simple, gets complex, back to simple. Man, the devil knew how to put a dart, you know, arrow in me. But we decided to give it a chance, and we kept walking along, and he, he did save us. And I got a lot of scars. Things happen that I won't tell you about because I don't have time. But um, I became perfect probably three years later. It's been wonderful. <laughs> No, my life has been a mess just like yours is. And God is so good. He keeps waking me up. You know, I've been president of a conference, sitting on a committee, and all of a sudden I feel the Holy Spirit saying, you, you're going to sleep again, man. You're becoming a bureaucrat. Think with my eyes. See the vision of the book of Acts again. Even now, I just I pray I won't become a bureaucrat. You said I carry out policies. That's the last thing I've ever wanted. <laughs> We're out there trying to help pastors and their families have real spiritual revival. I just got back from Istan, you know, and those countries, man, they are so weak in Adventist membership. Persecuted every country, just about Afghanistan, 30 million people, no Adventist member there. You know, it's, it's God, God's church needs a major waking up, but we need to be awakened. And I believe this week is a chance again for me to be awakened. Thank you for letting me come. It's not a great privilege for me to be here. It's every time Janet and I share, we are blessed the most. That's how it works. Um, and anyway, what I want to share in the last few minutes I have is burning in my heart then was that I thought Jesus was coming so soon I probably couldn't go to school. Well, it's been a few years. <laughs> huh? So how are you dealing with that question? Do you believe he's coming soon? Really soon? How soon? Hmm? That's the question. You know, is this thing hundreds of years off and we just go ahead and live our lives good here and make sure we're confessed up before we die? Is that, is that the way to live? Is that the... <laughs> the way we have success. And I struggle with that. And you know, when you look at the signs in Matthew 24, I mean, I don't have to preach a sermon on that to you, do I? You know, political upheaval, men's hearts fearing them for fear, terrorism, uh, disasters, and on and on it goes, the sinful, sinless of the world, and you know, the political upheaval. Hi, oh my goodness. <laughs> I won't say anything more about Janet today. <laughs> I've been very good, Janet. Anyway, um, and the papacy? What about the papacy? All the false Christ, false religions, we could tell you about all these countries. And the, and the papacy? I mean, you know, 2008, the financial crisis, what? They're saying, hey, we need to get rid of Wall Street. They are, they're greedy. You need a moral religious power to run the economy of the world, right? And they've been giving their resume at every G20 since. We're the Catholic Church. We can run it. And calling for the Sabbath, calling for all these things. Now for everybody to come back home, calling the the Protestants in America, come back home. We'll, we'll settle the differences later. October 31st, on Luther's 500th, here you have the Methodists, the Lutherans, the Anglicans, all signing an agreement that we agree with the Catholics on justification by faith. God, help us, you know. And what did Ellen White say? You know, this last sign? The Adventist church will be Laodicean. We can give you testimony. <laughs> There's wonderful people all over this church in every spot, Adventists. But also, we are lukewarm. And we are worldly in so many ways. So, and again, an economic, religious power that's going to be Revelation 13. It's, it's all in place. Everything's in place except one thing. What's that? One sign. What is Matthew 24? Is it one sign that has not been fulfilled? What is it? Yeah, this gospel that came to be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. How are we doing with that one? How long will it be before Jesus comes? Huh? Uh, what do you think in your life, in your church? Uh, what does God say to us today. And I've been thinking about that, chewing on a long time. And, um, you know, we, we had a global mission conference about three years ago at the GC. And they brought in good news about what had happened the last 25 years. We've entered a lot of dark territories. We're in all these languages. And the news was really good. Every 28 seconds, somebody's being baptized in Adventist in the world. Hallelujah. <laughs> Every two and a half hours, a new church being planted. 3,000 plus members a day joining this movement. It's amazing. This came out of a little group of people with no education, no money, <laughs> disappointed, mocked by everybody because Jesus hadn't come. And when they got the vision and they understood what it was about, Jesus said, now go to the whole world. And now Janet and I go, every place we go, we find little Adventist church, little Adventist school, little clinic, in the middle of the Congo, middle of everywhere we go. It's there. It was impossible, but it's happening. We're in over 900 languages and 200 and some countries out of 230. The news was very good. We've made a lot of progress. But then came the bad news. The archives and statistics people. How are we doing in the world? Still 1.8 billion people have never heard the name of Jesus. 
out of 7 billion. 1.8 billion never heard the name of Jesus. You know, North Africa, Middle East, that union, we were just there a couple of months ago. We have 4,000 members, 500 million people in those countries. And you know, religious freedom is not their strong suit. How long will it take to reach all of those people in those difficult, persecuted countries? The Istan countries, again, 100 million people, 30 million in Afghanistan, no religious person from Adventists there at all. Over and over, these big cities, 5 million. Maybe we haven't even entered. So, is it going to be hundreds of years? Then you go on up through Pakistan and India, China, over half the world's population, that 1040 window. And we don't do so well there. 95% Hindu, 95% Muslim, 95% Buddhist, secularism. We're just in Japan, a very small amount of Christians there. So, am I here to discourage you? No. Um, again, we've, Janet and I have been so many crazy places. And, we try to go wherever God sends us in the most difficult areas. We were in the heart of the Congo. The Union president wanted us to go there. It was great. We flew into this little grassy field in the middle of nowhere. And uh, here were the Adventists in their Dorcas uniforms and their Pathfinder uniforms, marching, drums. It was like the king had come to town or something, you know, in the middle of nowhere. We couldn't get out of there. The plane only comes in once a week. The Union president forgot to tell us that. So we had to get a four-wheel drive and drive out of there. And it was a, a bad story, a long story. But we broke down because of the big ruts and everything, in this little village, Pygmy Village. And uh, one of the Congolese guys said, I think there's a little church up this road. So we walked up the road. Sure enough, pastor's daughter comes out to meet us, welcomes us. There's a little Adventist church and a school, only one in the community, next door. God has done amazing things with this movement. But the challenges are just unbelievable. And uh, so, how long will it be? Jesus told us through the prophet he wanted to come back in the 1800s. So we're not waiting on his sovereignty. We're not waiting on some date he's got set. He wanted to come in the 1850s, 1888, 1901, if people had responded. So I'm in uh, Tanzania. Several hundred members there were leaders we're talking to. And I didn't plan to say this, but I did all of a sudden. I said, you know, we were just in the Congo, thinking out in the middle of nowhere. We were almost kidnapped later that night, by the way. Gun people across the road were driving after dark to catch up, and they, they wanted the white people. But God saved us. So, talk about adventure. You know, I said when I was in drugs, I was looking for adventure. <laughs> yeah, God is the most adventure in his life. But anyway, uh, I said to these guys in Tanzania, I said, you know, if, if the president of the U.S. were killed today, assassinated, how long would it take for everybody in the Congo, everybody in Africa, everybody in this world to know that, do you think? Barack Obama at the time, if was killed today, how long would you say it? Donald Trump was shot today. How long would it take for every person in the world to know that, do you think? Huh? One guy said two days. People laughed. No, no, no. Somebody else said one day. They laughed again. No, no. Hours. People in Africa say, well, shortwave radio, everything. If something major happens in the world, in a few hours, the whole world will be talking about it. So if God wanted to come back, well over 100 years ago, in the 1800s, and with one or two big miracles in the middle of this Adventist movement, would have everybody in the world talking about our message this week. Why doesn't he do it? What is he waiting for? What is he waiting for? He wants to come back. All the signs are there. He's not going to let this go on much longer. No, he's not. But what is he waiting for? Um, Look in Joel with me. I, I really believe that God's given us a couple of calls. And when we answer those calls, begin to really seriously, not just talk about them in Sabbath school class, not just say we should be doing it, but we really begin to answer them. I believe God will wrap this thing up so fast, <laughs> it'll make our heads spin around. We just won't be able to believe it. Because communication is there. Overnight, the message can go. Now, we should keep strategizing. We're moving into all these territories. We keep working. But if we, if we plan on that, the guy that's the union president in the Middle East says, you know, if every one of our members had a witness to somebody else in the Middle East Union every day, it would take us well over 400 years to reach everybody that's here. One time for a quick witness. So, if we're counting on that, we're in for the long haul, guys. We might as well go ahead and do business and find success in whatever we're doing and not worry about it. But in Joel, you know the background. Um, the locusts had come through, wiped out the food, no offering coming into the church. Said, priests, you need to wail. <laughs> no money coming in. 
Verse 14 of chapter 1 of Joel says, Consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the elders, call the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. Cry out. Pray like you've never prayed. And then in chapter 2, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. This is about the great day of the Lord. This is about the second coming here. It goes on, verse 12 and on. Therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. Repentance, real repentance from our sins. With fasting, with weeping, with mourning, rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. Verse 17. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Don't give your heritage to reproach the nations who rule over us. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? How is it in your church? When people come to visit... Do they sense richly the presence of God? Or do they go away saying, good music, well-organized program, good sermon, uh, catchy, good stories? Or do they say, man, God is doing stuff here. He's changing lives. <laughs> Miracles are happening. People are being healed just like the book of Acts. Hmm. Pray, repent, and draw near to God for his baptism of the Holy Spirit. I hope you do read that book Janet gave you. It's powerful. we got a testimony of Dwight I put over there on the table today. You can get his own testimony how it's changed. His life, his family, his ministry. So powerful. It starts a little slow, but by the time you get to the end, it's moved you. And it's changing lives. Anyway, um, okay, so John Maxwell. You know who John Maxwell is? Five more minutes. Five, okay. You know who John Maxwell is? He's a church growth leader in North America. He's written a lot of books. Dynamic guy. He said, you know, in the book of Acts, the disciples, and that's what Jesus told them eventually was, don't go anywhere until you waited in Jerusalem and you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Don't go and try to do this message. Don't arguing over who's the greatest and, and, and all this stuff that's in you. No, when you're converted, when you spent time in the upper room, when you're of one accord, you put aside the differences, then the baptism of the Spirit will come on you. And then when you go, people will be broken and converted and that's what happened 25 years they took the gospel of the whole world no money no degrees no education nothing except jesus and his resurrection power that's what paul said i finally figured that out it's not about how much i know or how zealous i am it's about a real relationship with jesus and experiencing the power of his resurrection you know? and he said besides that he said the disciples spent 10 days praying 10 days 10 minutes preaching and thousands were converted he said, in the Christian church today, we tend to spend 10 minutes praying, <laughs> 10 days, 10 weeks preaching, doing evangelism, and we're thankful if we get anybody. A.W. Tozer said it like this, 95% of what we do in the Christian church today would continue on if the Holy Spirit was not there, if he was withdrawn. And we probably wouldn't notice. Huh? We have got the programs. We've got the methods. We have the orders of service. We have evangelistic tools. We have centers of influence, we got everything. The problem is we don't have the power. We just have programs. And we rush, we get up in the morning, we're too busy to go out and do our work and, and try to do something for the church and for God and we just don't connect. And Jesus says, without me, you can't do anything. Not really. You can't do anything that'll last. Look at me, I was the busiest guy I ever lived. But I had to have that time with the Father because I needed to know what to do for the day. I needed to know how to move. I needed to be filled with the Spirit so that I had the power to do the things he needed me to do. So, you read the rest of Joel, you know how it goes. When we do this, when we stop just theologically, theoretically discussing it in Sabbath school and in our homes and whatever we're doing, then, verse 18, the Lord will be zealous for his land, pity his people. The Lord will answer. Verse 21, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do marvelous things among you. I will send the former and the latter rain down upon you. And verse 27, then you shall know that I am in your midst, that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters. By the way, I am deeply impressed with this group of collegiates that I've been working with down there, just talking to. They should be talking to me. 
they're serious about Jesus. When they sing and praise, I sense His presence. You know, they're, they're committed. So I thank God. And around the world, we're seeing young adults are rising up in Scandinavia, Australia, Europe, the United States, places that are dead in some ways. But the young adults are saying, baby boomers, get out of the way. Sick of your whining. Well and white. We got it shoved down our throat. They want to know what she said because she's from Jesus. And they want to do it. They want to be a part of the mission. They're willing to go to the Middle East. Many of them are there now just as students. Waldensian well, students just going to school so they can possibly tell somebody about God. That's, that's our young adults. Yeah, our young men, our sons and our daughters will prophesy. Our old men, that's me and Janet, will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Also my men servants, my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Ellen White said, when Protestants reach their hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of Catholicism, the very next thing that will happen, we're there, they're doing it. Whole con congregations are standing and applauding the Pope's call to come back home. Uh, when that happens, she says, the very next thing to happen is Satan will pour out his miracles. Satan is going to bring fire from the sky. He may raise people from the dead. I don't know what he's going to do. But God's miracles are coming in right behind. It's going to happen. And when those miracles pop, when we do raise somebody from the dead with their faith in God, when, when he does some amazing things in this Adventist movement, the world is going to be talking about it very, very soon. And this message can be finished overnight. And it's going to happen. I believe God is ready. It's, it's, he's waited long enough, 170 years is long enough. And I believe he's coming very soon. Communication's in place, it's all there. Where will we be in that journey? Uh, I want to see you all there. I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of that last mission. And I'm getting a little older, so hurry up. You know, let's <laughs> <laughs> no, I know you guys are sincere. You wouldn't be at camp meeting. You wouldn't take this time unless you wanted to have that experience. But he's calling us higher. He's calling us to something more right now to that baptism of the Holy Spirit every day so that we will see all these providences happening in our life and coincidences. We will see um, changed fruit. We will bear fruit, and that fruit may be surprising to us. It'll be more character change than it is numbers of baptism right away. But when the character changes, when we reveal Him, <laughs> then He'll be ready to come. And people will be drawn in mass to a group of people that's like Jesus. They always have been. So, anyway, I'd like to take just a minute and invite you... Uh, I don't know if it's comfortable to kneel where you are, but I'd like to take just a minute in silent prayer. We won't pray together this time, but just respond. We, we ask the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Did He touch on a sin with you? Something you need to confess and ask Him to help you? The Holy Spirit's the only thing that can give us repentance. The only one who can help us change, really change. Um, is it time with God? Uh, you know you're not powered because you don't have enough real quality time, and you're going to make some decisions. Just like what Harvey's talking about with health. I need to make some decisions about what, what I do in my health. Decisions about our time with God may be even more important for us first. And then we can make the health decisions we need to make too. So you just talk to him about whatever you need and claim his promises. He will give you victory through the Spirit. claiming that promise again in Ezekiel 36, 25, 26 this morning. It goes right along with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It says that you will sprinkle us with clean water and we'll be cleansed. You'll give us a new heart. Take the stony heart out of our flesh and give us a heart of flesh. And You will put the Spirit in us. He will rip up the idols. He will fill us. He will help us to walk in your judgments and to do them. Lord, I can't change. I've, I've tried some of these things for so many years, kind of struggling my own power, and I don't have the power through the will to, to do it. I need a total change from the Holy Spirit in these, some of these areas, Lord, you know that. And I pray for this group. Thank you for their earnestness and their desire to really uh, 
be all you want them to be. And pray for the churches, Lord. Raise us up in North America and around the world. Uh, we need a revival everywhere. Uh, we're a lot the same everywhere as people. The world just draws us in. And there are different strongholds in every culture. It may be religious persecution or political persecution or just affluence. You said one of Laodicea's great problems would be covetousness in the end that needs to be broken. So whatever it is with us, God, uh, please do it. We want this camp meeting not to just be another week with pleasant friendships and a lot of uh, nice activities, but we want it to be the beginning of the latter rain in our families, in our churches, in our church worldwide. God, bring a revival. Those kids in collegiate singing that song, send a revival and let it start with me. Powerful song. God, I pray that for this group, for me. Help us all to be willing to let you take us over. And then we know what happens. We'll be the last few chapters of the book of Acts. And we'll just rejoice in you doing it and give you the glory and the praise. So bless each one. Anoint them with the baptism of the Spirit. Bless their children. Help them to come back the way I came back, Lord. And if some of them have drifted away, please touch them even today. Work on their hearts. Thank you so much, Jesus, for hearing, for wanting us, wanting to spend time with us. We give you glory and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.